Good morning. My name is Ana Fernandez. I'm a biologist working on science, outreach and communication in the University of Murcia. And I'm here with my colleague and mentor, Delfina Roca. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Soledad Rubio and her team at the University of Valencia for allowing us to participate in this workshop. So I'm going to share my screen and I'll briefly introduce you all to our project. In 2019, 12 of the most representative entities in the generation of science and its communication in the Valencian community and the region of Murcia created a consortium in order to carry out the project MedNight, which stands for Mediterranean Night, uh, as a way of promotion or preparation of the European Researchers' Night during the previous, previous early months uh, to its celebration. We wanted to show the attractiveness and importance of the researchers work and profession to the general public, carrying out a series of activities framed under the common umbrella of what we have come to call Mediterranean science. Uh, we defined and valued Mediterranean science with the aim of creating a feeling of identity and belonging to it and recognize it as something we can be proud of and intangible heritage that we must take care of. We also established uh, eight topics to work on and talk about that were and already are climate change, sea and pollution, geology and biodiversity, diet and nutrition, life and health, history and heritage, pioneering women and future. This year, we are funded by the European Commission and have become international. To the Spanish institutions, two partners from Greece and Cyprus have joined the consortium, all coordinated by the Alicante-based company El Caleidoscopio. The institutions are FISAVIO, Foundation for the Promotion of Health and Biomedical Research of Valencian Region, Jaume the First University, University of Valencia, in Cliva, Foundation for Research of the Clinic Hospital of the Valencian Community, the SIG, the Valencian Delegation of the Spanish National Research Council, University of Murcia, University of Alicante, MUDIC, Foundation Didactic and Interactive Science Museum of the Vega Baja del Segura of Valencian Community, Technical, University of Cartagena, Seneca Foundation, Science and Technology Agency, Agency uh, of the Region of Murcia, Psycho Greece and Psycho Cyprus. Each institution of the consortium will carry out its own activities, which together will uh, give shape to midnight 2021. Midnight has one goal the integration of all the Mediterranean countries under a single flag that puts us all together to share the task of caring for our sea. The most visited sea in the world faces always unabated challenges, such as water acidification and biodiversity loss, unstoppable overfishing, very few protected areas, micro and macro pollution and the necessity of legally binding environmental policies. We also seek to achieve more goals regarding research and awareness of many aspects of it. For example, uh, we will make visible the figure of women in research naming our event in Spanish, Italian and Greek using the feminine gender. In Spanish, it will be La Noche Mediterránea de las Investigadoras, the Mediterranean Night of She Researchers. And we will also be promoting the participation of the female researchers in all the fields. We also show that researchers are normal people, even though their work is not the average. So we will give them the opportunity to tell us how rewarding it can be to participate in research projects, to show the different skills you acquire when studying a scientific career, or even show that you can be a scientist and even make jokes. 
And of course, we will talk about the open character of our scientific research as encouraged by European Union and many other institutions. Science must be public and research must be done with and for society to aim that will make sure that the night's activities will help to incorporate citizens to the different stages of the scientific tasks, as well as allow them to share ideas and foster new views on specific lines of research. What about the previous activities? Well, they are the transversal activities and well, and as I think it's a bit late, I only name them and I invite you to visit the web, explore them all and participate or tell your friends. So we've got the exhibition about women scientists from countries of the Mediterranean basin, the literary contest of short stories of scientific topics focused to children in hospital, migrants in reception centers, and elderly people in residences. The Green Challenge video contest related to geology and biodiversity, sea and pollution, climate and clean energies, and life and health. Mind the lab, where scientists literally move the lab to a public place, squares or neighborhoods, to impress the public through short-lived scientific events. The Mediterranean science team, where 11 relevant researchers will be selected by a jury. And finally, this communication workshop we are about to enjoy. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm thrilled to introduce you to our speaker today. His name is Michele Cantanzaro. He's a physicist and a journalist. He collaborates with Nature, El Periódico, that is a Spanish newspaper, and other media. He has published in Sudauce Zeitung, Der Spiegel, The Guardian, Republica Italia, Le Cienza, and other outlets. His work has been recognized also by the King of Spain International Journalism Prize for his investigation in the justice miscarriage case of Oscar Sanchez the European Science Writer of the Year 2016 Award for his investigation in forensic phonetics, or the Prismas Award for his coverage of CRISPR, among many, many others. He has been director and script writer for the Spanish public television, and also teaches and mentors students in science communication at Masters at the Autonomous University of Barcelona and Big University among many, many, many more things. So thank you very much, and I give you the floor. Thanks a lot, Anna. Thanks to the Midnight Project for having me. OK, so since I'm a journalist, I will start with something strong. And while I share my screen, uh, let me tell you uh, the first example, the first story I will tell you is a story I have covered, and it implies uh, two homicides. So if anybody of you may feel distressed by this, uh, just phase out for two minutes, and then there will be one other example that is less, uh, let's say, violent, okay? But, you know, uh, being journalist, this is the sort of things that you happen to cover. And uh, I will start with, a, I mean, jokingly journalistic title, Science in the Media, It Kills, It Saves Lives. So this is my first example. Uh, these two scientists uh, are from Mexico, from the National Autonomous University of Mexico, and uh, they were, unfortunately killed on the university campus. And the homicides were claimed by a group called Individual Standing Towards the Wild, who has made a lot of, uh, that has claimed a lot of uh, actions. Here is a partial map published in Nature of their actions. And uh, what they do is uh, they post lengthy claims on the internet in which they explain why they have carried out these uh, crimes. And uh, they literally quote, they lift text, in fact, from popular science literature. The, like, for example, this article published in Wired by Bill Joy, Why the Future Doesn't Need Us, uh, books like The Age of Spiritual Machines by Ray Kurzweil, Engines of Creation by Eric Drexler, etc. All this popular science literature goes below, let's say, the umbrella of what is called transhumanism, which is a tendency that states that we are close to a tipping point in which uh, biotechnology, genetics, uh, 
um, nanotechnology, inter artificial intelligence, etc. All these new scientific and technological tools are pushing us towards this tipping point in which we will be able to do things like, you know, downloading our brain on a chip or achieving almost eternal life or freeing ourselves from the laws of nature. Whoever has some familiar familiarity with science knows that this is sort of a very hyped way of portraying where these fields are. I mean, we are not able to understand cancer or Alzheimer, so probably we're very far away from that sort of tipping point. And of course, I'm not claiming that this literature is responsible of those homicides, but it is an example of how the way in which science is portrayed in the media has an impact on science, in, in this case a very negative and tragic impact in fact. This is an article I wrote on The Guardian to report on this story. So is this the only way of, uh, of uh, talking about, for example, nanotechnology, which is one of the targets of this group? Nanotechnology, they believe it will bring us to the gray goo, this scenario in which uh, nanomachines will destroy the world, etc. Well, I mean, there are other possible ways of telling the story. This is, for example, one I've taken from uh, Chris Toomey, an American anthropologist who quotes a short story that starts with the following situation. There is a group of Islamic scholars that are discussing the following problem. Thanks to nanotechnology, we are now able to uh, build pig meat directly out of atoms and molecules. So is that pig meat, so, so without slicing it out from a pig, okay? So is that pig meat halal? Is it something that is allowed by the Islamic religion? So I think that is a very compelling narrative. It's, very, it's a very attractive way of talking about uh, the sort of ethical problems that nanotechnology can pose without incurring into this very dramatic representation that these terrorists, in fact, have believed in. That is the fact that we will, have will will have eternal life or uh, yeah or downloading brain on a chip or these sort of things so it is equally compelling but it, it is much more it is much closer to the actual scientific and ethical problems that are being posed by nanotechnology which is something much more prosaic than you know achieving eternal life and, and it's something like for example should we put silver nanoparticles in socks to avoid uh feet stinking because uh, silver nanoparticles are uh, kill bacteria, but at the same time, they uh, also penetrate in, uh, in human cells. I'm giving this example because it shows uh, this one, it shows very clearly, once again, how the way in which science is portrayed in the media has an impact on science, and in this case, a negative one. Now, let's talk about the positive impact. So by now, the guys that, or girls that may have been affected by the homicides can, could, uh, could come back to the presentation because this example is uh, <clears throat> very serious, but not uh, so violent. So this person is called Andrew Wakefield. He's a doctor. He published in the 90s a famous paper in The Lancet in, in which he connected autism and the MMR vaccine. Okay, so this paper published in The Lancet, so top level medical journal, claimed that MMR could cause autism. And this had an actual impact on the rate of vaccines in the UK for example, or at least it was correlated with a drop in the rate of vaccines in the UK. So a journalist, in fact, so not a scientist, a freelance journalist carried out a long in-depth investigation. Brian Deere, he has published a book on the topic last year, by the way, in which he found basically two facts. First of all, Andrew Wakefield had cherry-picked data. So he had selected the stories and the cases he uh, collected in the Lancet paper in order to confirm his thesis and to achieve statistical significance that was not there. And secondly, he had a clear conflict of interest because he was advising lawyers that were suing pharmaceutical companies that produce vaccine under the claim that those vaccines had generated caused autism in their clients. After a lot of resistance, in fact, from the scientific community, in the end, the paper was retracted. So once again, here we see that what happens in the media has an impact on science, in this case, a very positive impact. It is something like carrying out a job of fact checking, of, uh, you know, really controlling for the quality of the evidence that science itself had not carried out. So I'm telling these two stories because usually the relation between science and journalism is portrayed in a very naive way. You would have, let's say, only the top arrow 
So science is something that is done in the lab, and then it is uh, sort of thrown to the journalists that what they must do is basically metabolize what scientists do and translate it to the public, and that's the end of the story. I think by the end of this talk tomorrow, this morning, you will see that there's much more than this. And the first thing is that there is a feedback arrow. That is what happens in the field of journalists has an impact on science, has as these two examples have shown. And then we will show that also the top arrow, so the relation between science and journalism is not that naive as I portrayed it before. So before going on, let's uh, make a, a, a stop and let me show you what is the outline of this uh, workshop. So the structure of the workshop is the following. So today, it, it, the format of the discussion will be basically a talk and then there will be time for question and answers and debate with you. And uh, the title is Science in the Media, the Dark Side and the Bright Side. So basically, I will try to give you a sort of no naive portrait of how science really works in the media. Tomorrow's talk will be much more practical. It will be a case study analysis and a series of, uh, let's say, advice or suggestion on uh, how to carry out effective science writing. And also there will be plenty of time for question and answer. And this will be, the, let's say, the open part of this, uh, of this workshop. Then there will be a closed part on uh, Wednesday and Tuesday and Thursday that is open only to those that have uh, applied to it. And I think there is a restricted number of participants. It's 40, I think. And in those parts, what we will do is in the first day, take a very good journalistic text and analyze it all together. And in the, in the fourth days, we will really divide in groups, uh, pick real papers and try to write a text or draft a text uh, that uh, transforms, let's say, these papers into something that is suitable for a non-specialized public. So throughout the second, third, and fourth session, we will increasingly be understanding what makes for an effective text. So in the second session, I will analyze the text. In the third, you will analyze together with me an existing text. And in the fourth, we will try to produce a text, OK? so. I think by iterating this process three times in a different way and more and more intensely with more and more participation by the end of the workshop, you will have a clearer idea of uh, how effective science communication uh, works or at least you some tips on how, how to carry it out. But now let's start with the first session. So the dark side and the bright side of science in the media, I will start with the bright side. So as I, as I with the dark side, sorry. As uh, I mentioned, there is this feedback loop. So this uh, bottom arrow that shows that uh, the traditional vision of science and science communication as two separate issues. So scientists basically do science, science communication basically do science communication, and they don't interact with each other. They're very clearly separate uh, topics. Uh, it's not so clear. And uh, the two examples I gave at the beginning are uh, go along this line, but uh, this, this issue is much more than anecdotes. And I will show you a study that really makes this point very clearly. So this study analyzed the papers by the New England Journal of Medicine that were reported on in the New York Times. And it uh, found that in the following 10 years, after the New York Times report, this fact translated into a, an extra percentage of citations from other scientific papers, okay? So the fact of having your paper reported in the New York Times had an impact well beyond popularization. It really impacted, let's say, the, 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 the yeah, it really impacted the impact of your paper in terms of the citations that it received. And moreover, they were able to really disentangle causation. So it was not that the New York Papers journalists were able to pick papers to report on that would have had anyway those extra number of citations because they were very good. It was really the New York Times reporting that caused this extra citation. They could prove that by the fact that during a period of time, the New York Times did not go publish because it, there was a strike, but still there was an internal edition that was carried out to preserve the continuity of the archive. And this effect disappeared when the New York Times was not out, was not published, okay? So once again, this finding shows that what happens in the media 
really has a strong impact on science. It's not something separated from science, that science communication is a part of science, okay? And now let's talk about, let's say, the, the top arrow, okay? Which is the one that people usually accept more, I mean, in general, because they say, okay, yes, science, there is a, let's say, a flux of communication that goes from the lab to the newspapers, et cetera, and this is because of, you know, we want to popularize our science, we want to give back to society, et cetera. But then I will show you that things are not so, let's say, blue sky, okay? Ironically, I call the way in which science communicate with the press as a propaganda machinery. Of course, it's ironic. I'm not saying that... Uh, uh, science is carrying out propaganda, but I'm saying that science is one of the most effective fields of human activity in shaping how the media report about it. Usually there is a big complaint that the media don't understand science, that uh, they misportray it, etc. And it is partially true, but it's also true that science manages to shape how the media portray it in a very effective manner, much more effective than other areas like politics, economics, etc. And so let me tell you, for example, about the key mechanism of this communication between science and the media, the mechanism of press releases, okay? So this is an example of the press release website of Nature magazine, so one of the top level international magazines. You enter in it and you get in advance what Nature will publish in the next few days. So for example, now I could get a press release of, I mean, maybe not today, but tomorrow or Wednesday, I could get to a list of the articles that will be published in Nature on Thursday. And the same happens for science and all the top outlets. And I get a summary, I get the paper, I get supplementary information, I also get a picture sometimes, I get uh, maybe audios, videos, etc. under an embargo agreement. Here you see embargoed until. This is a very old uh, screen capture, but uh, the system is basically the same nowadays. Embargoed means that I can pub, I'm, I'm, I'm allowed to access this information in advance, but with the explicit commitment that I will not publish it until a given time and day that is established by the outlet. And uh, the same happens for science. Science has a much larger platform called Eureka Alert in which they have tens, now, now this list is much, much longer. They have uh, maybe 20 top level newspapers, you know, JAMA, Cell Press, the Lancet, PNAS, Science, etc. And also there you get access to news in advance. What is the rationale of this system? The rationale of this system is that leading uh, magazines, science magazines, provide to all journalists information in advance at the same time, so nobody has an advantage, and they have some time to prepare the story. This is a very effective system. When I say that science is very effective in shaping how it is portrayed in the media, here this sentence is uh, translated into numbers with this study. In this study, they analyzed the science coverage of seven leading newspapers, the New York Times, Le Figaro, Le Monde, El País, La Vanguardia, La Repubblica, and the International Herald Tribune, and they checked whether among the 150 more or less stories that they, on science that they, that they analyzed, whether how many of them had been preceded by a press release by four major journals, PMJ, Nature, Science, and The Lancet. And they found that 84% of them were preceded by a press release. So arguably, only a very tiny minority, 16%, were self-generated by the journalists. All the rest was really fed by what I call, ironically, this propaganda machinery of science, okay? So it was not the journalists taking the initiative of covering a story, asking a question, et cetera, but it was something that was provided and moreover provided in a very metabolized form with a summary, with the pictures, with audio, with video, etc. by those scientific institutions. So one could say, okay, but what's wrong with that? I mean, they give you information in advance, they give you in a very easy shape, etc. What else do you want? What, what, what's the matter? What's the problem with this? There are, in fact, some problems. And here I mention some of them. First of all, press releases are far from being unbiased ways of portraying a finding. In this study, for example, they analyzed nine prominent medical journals and over 100 press releases that were uh, issued by over, sorry, 120 press releases that were issued by these medical journals, and they found that only a minority mentioned something as crucial as the limitations of the study. That is, only, 
that is the vast majority of the press releases really only mentioned the findings, mentioned what they had discovered and not mentioned what was unclear, what was not discovered, what were the open questions, okay, what was not explained by this finding. And even more worryingly, among those that had industrial funding, only 22% of the press releases mentioned this industrial funding, okay? So imagine how sensitive it is this information in medical topics, okay? It's a matter of conflict of interest. And still, in this machinery that manages to shape the information in the press, only a minority mentioned this very key, sensitive, crucial information. Another problem, let's say, with how this whole system is built is what is the embargo paradox, okay? So, okay, I get the information in advance, I have time to prepare it in advance, I'm, I don't have any advantage or disadvantage with respect to other journalists, thanks to, thanks to embargo, but at the same time, I'm forced to keep the information confidential. So, how can I double check it if I cannot discuss it openly with a big number of science? So, usually journalists, let's say, manage to solve this topic by having a good agenda, by having a good um, agenda of experts that they can contact confidentially to ask for comments. But sometimes it happens that when the paper is out, then there is a broad reaction of the scientific community criticizing the paper and showing that those findings were not very important, which happens maybe one or two days after the paper is out. And during the embargo period, it's impossible to obtain this sort of feedback, okay? Maybe your one, two experts have time to quickly read that uh, embargoed paper and give a reasonable opinion, but they are not able to really tap on the broad expertise of the community okay and so this is how it happens that sometimes you know we get titles like this drug cures alzheimer and then after the paper is published or this drug is an effective treatment for alzheimer and after the paper is published you see that the claim is really uh, bold and uh, and things are much less shiny okay so are there questions comment question remark do you agree with what i'm saying or not okay fine so why does science put in place this, this sort of uh, very effective way of shaping its image in the media that I ironically call propaganda? And I, I insist that it's ironic because it's true that these biases are there, but it's also true that there is a lot of good intentions, that many press releases are well done, and that it, the world would be much worse if we wouldn't have that transparency mechanism of the press releases. But still, we have to bear in mind that that is not enough, that there is still an important role uh, for journalism that I will discuss later on. So why? I mean, there are plenty of reasons. There are even personal reasons like the ambition of individual researchers. Of course, there is very honest reasons like the desire to communicate with society to make your research useful etc there are economic pressure so the presence in the media is a way of uh, uh, obtaining more exposure in the face of uh, funders and there is also ideology that plays a role and one example in which a lot of these ingredients uh, play a role is the famous human genome project one of the absolute uh, historical moments of science in which still a lot of these uh, communicational biases play the role. Let me show you, for example, two quotes by a Nobel laureate, Walter Gilbert. In a press conference, he pulled out a CD of his pocket and he said, three million bases of DNA sequence can be put on a single compact disc and one day we will be able to put pull a CD, a CD out and of one pocket and say, here is a human being. It's me. And for example, Henry G, an editor at Nature, he said, uh, genomics will allow us to fashion the human form into any conceivable shape. We will have extra limbs if we want them, maybe even wings to fly. Ten years later, Nature, you can look now at the bottom right of the screen, Nature published an editorial that watch was much less poetic called Best Deeds Yet to Come. The world got a little overexcited about the Human Genome Project. The human genome has, has had a certain tendency to incite passions and excess. Nowadays, we know that a person is not a sequence of DNA bases, that we will not be able to have extra limbs or wings to fly thanks to the Human Genome Project. So what happened? Why were this intensely hyped version of the project being thrown to the press? There is a lot of factors to be taken into account. There is a whole 
book, Genes de Papel, by Matiana González Silva, that analyzed this topic. One, let's mention two important factors. First of all, the cost of the project, okay? It was a very costly project, and so many scientists incurred into hype in order to push funders to fund this project. And then there was also an ideological component to it, which uh, Matiana González Silva points out. We are in the 90s, so in the post reagan thatcher era in which in the famous debate between nature and nurture between whether the for example disease is basically inherited and depends basically on yeah bad luck or it depends on social condition the quality of health the health system etc in this debate in those years the um, let's say the weight was a lot on the nature side okay there was a lot of tendency of saying okay it's not a matter of the state it's a matter of uh, inheritance it's a matter of uh, what you get from your parents at most it's a matter of your individual choice of lifestyle lifestyle etc and so this narrative in which everything is written in the gene in which there are genes of you know the gene of dictatorship the gene of diabetes the gene of you know intimate partner violence etc we have seen this sort of title titles in the media in the past decade all this resonated with this ideology in which there was no place for social let's say issues and everything was inherited so I think this is a very nice example of how very relevant and important scientific project was wrapped into a narrative that was uh, tainted somehow with uh, certain propagandistic tones. And so why is propaganda successful? Why we, the media, are so prone to buying this sort of propaganda? There are many reasons. One of them, for example, in this uh, survey that was carried out in nature before the previous financial crisis so things probably now are much worse but they haven't updated the survey they found that one third of the newsrooms in us and canada had experienced staff cut and in the following decade this has come massively to newsrooms in europe as well and that the majority of journalists perceived that the number of assignments had increased in the last few years so of course there is less time and more more work to be done and this uh, makes journalists more prone to a critically buying uh, well-packaged information that comes from scientific institutions. And then there is a multidimensional crisis. The last one is the financial crisis, the previous one and the one that has been triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic. But there was a previous one, the internet crisis. We are still, um, let's say, trying to understand how we can make money out of the internet. And then there is an even deeper crisis, which is in the 90s. So when the internet was not yet thriving and uh, the media companies were still really powerful and rich companies, there was a sort of um, corporation takeover on the media. So instead of sticking to their constitutional role of being a strange thing, something that is a private company that must make money, but at the same time, a key piece of democracy, the private company, let's say, component took a very strong role. So we saw things like, for example, CEOs that came from other industries that took control of the media and that applied to the media, which I repeat is something that constitutionally is a piece of democracy, the same logic that you would apply to any other piece of economy. So all these crises make the media very weak and very prone to propaganda in science and in other areas. And moreover, in science specifically, there is a sort of genetic, I would say, tendency to make information, journalism, and public relations. Uh, I will give you just an example. The first Pulitzer Prize for science, William Lawrence, was writing at the New York Times at the same time in which he was on the payroll of the Pentagon, of the War Department at that time, to write press release on the nuclear bomb. And of course, his coverage of the bo Japanese bombings in the New York Times was biased by his position in the War Department. So, and still this do, does not, was not a problem for him, for him receiving a Pulitzer Prize. So specifically in science journalism, we have a sort of more intense and more uh, complicated relation with PR, okay? And so this brings me to the end of this, let's say this uh, dark part, the dark side, as I mentioned before, of science in the media, which is the question, are we science journalists cheerleaders or watchdogs of, of scientists? This is the cover of Nature when the World Conference of Science Journalists was carried out in London. Another metaphor that I like a lot is, are we science journalists closer to sports journalists whose 
role sometimes is conceived as generating excitement around football or even around a specific team? Or are we closer to movie critics whose role is to provide context and to provide a critical analysis of what happens in science? I mean, when I, when, I, when I use the metaphor of sports journalists, sometimes it really happens in the real world. I mean, you can see a stream in science journalists that is really, you know, applauding to science and, uh, yeah, creating excitement around science, even creating excitement, for example, around, you know, Spanish science or British science. There was a magazine in Spain. There is a magazine in Spain that has even created the national Spanish science team. Okay, so the metaphor is really, I mean, it really happened in reality. It's not just a fantasy of me. So the three of us, sports journalists, movie critics, and science journalists, in general, we love the topic we're out about. Science journalists, we love science. We are interested in science. And the same happens for sports journalists and movie critics. But while movie critics conceive their mission as providing this context, as taking a distance, as being able to talk critically about the topic or analytically about the topic they write about, often uh, sports journalists don't. And I think science journalists should be closer, let's say, to movie critics than to sports journalists. In other words, we have seen that there is this very complex interaction between science and journalism, and there is a very negative scenario in which, let's say, the relation between uh, science and journalism is basically driven by propaganda on the one hand, and on the other hand by cheerleading, by focusing on trendy science, and uh, usually sometimes, and, and, and the other side of the coin, the flip side of the coin is inter irrational attacks on science. We often see in the very same pages in which scientists are portraits, are gods, you know, uh, saints, etc. that are in the very same pages, sometimes they are portrayed as demons and as those that want to, you know, destroy nature, etc. So this is a, the, what I call the agenda setting scenario. And then I call the, the, the alternative scenario is the democratic participation scenario. So a scenario in which the relation between science and journalism is driven not by propaganda, but by transparency, by social engagement, and the relation between journalism and science is driven by watchdogging, watchdogging and critical scrutiny. One last remark before the end of the first part of this talk, the picture could be even made more complicated by bringing in a third actor, which is the public, or we could say the publics of science, okay? I will not enter into this um, feedback, other feedback loop, but just let me give you two quick inputs on, on it, based on two studies that show you how complicated the re also the relation between journalists and the public can become. So there is an example uh, here on the top. Dan Kahan is a researcher that has worked on this concept of cultural cognition, and he carried out examples of this sort. For example, he took groups of people that were very in favor on, or very against nanotechnology and uh, put them to talk together. So those that were very in favor in a group and those that were very against in another group. And he provided to both groups exactly the same information, very well grinded information, unbiased, objective, etc. And he wanted to check whether this process made the group to become less polarized at the end. Okay, so whether discussing on the basis of objective information resulted into smaller distance in the opinion of the two groups at the end of the process. And alas, he found that the opposite happened, okay? So that by providing this objective information, the groups became even more polarized at the end. The distance between the two groups, in opinion, was even, lar was even larger. What had happened? It, ha it had happened that each group had cherry-picked, in fact, the information. So they had picked in the objective information that they were given only things that confirmed their prejudices, okay? So this is sort of a tragic result for a journalist because it shows that information is not enough, okay? So that things are much more complex than simply providing objective information to the public and then this will result in a, a more responsible and more rational and more moderated um, decisions. So what else matters? This second experiment gives you an idea of what else can matter. So in this experiment, what they did is that this objective information was spoken, was articulated by four actors that with their, simply with their style, with their exterior aesthetic style, sort of impersonated topical versions of the experts. So for example, the one on the top left is the sort of expert that a person that is uh, very in favor of uh, individualism and of hierarchy would expect. 
So a person with a tie, a senior person, etc. And the top right, at, at, at the bottom right, is the sort of expert that uh, a communitarian and egalitarian person may uh, sort of trust more. So you know, with a beard, younger, etc. Incredibly, uh, the experiment found that this very you know, aesthetic exterior things mattered, that the acceptance of the two different groups of the same message was modulated by something as superficial as the appearance of the expert. So this shows you, for example, how important it is, for example, now in a time of uh, in which uh, there could have been, although it has not happened, uh, vaccine ex ex exigency, at least in Spain, it has not happened. But for example, in the US, it is definitely a, an important matter. And in, uh, in France, for example, it is, etc how important it is that the same scientific objective message is spoken, is articulated by different actors, and it's wrapped in ways that is comprehensible to different publics and in ways to which different groups can relate to, okay? So I will not enter too much in these details. These things are really fascinating, but uh, it shows you how complicated it is also the side of the relation of journalists with the public, okay? It's not just a matter of writing a bunch of objective information. I mean, that is the basis. So if you don't want to give objective information, you are not a journalist, but there are also added ingredients to be taken into account. Okay, so this part is a bit gloomy. Uh, now we will move to the bright side. Would, would it be okay for you to ask questions, make comments, make remarks. Do you agree with this picture? Is it something that you had talked about, thought about? Don't be shy. I, I was in a, I was in a um, debate, in fact, on synthetic biology organized by Victor De Lorenzo, I think a couple of months ago. And um, precisely on this topic, I mean, he wanted to discuss about, um, yeah, um, how, for example, what sort of names we can give to certain areas of synthetic biology um, that make it more comprehensible to the public, and also, for example, um, why certain issues of synthetic biology, like the fact that uh, insulin has been now produced uh, for more than two decades, I think three, I think, uh, by genetically modified bacteria, why this topic is not so um, debated in the public arena or not so known in the public arena, etc. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I was very positively impressed about how that field, how mature is that field with respect to this issue, how they really um, take into account, let's say from the beginning of their research projects, the communication uh, issue, which I think is something very wise. There is this famous publication called um, Late Lessons from Early Warning, which is a sort of analysis of um, how certain topics have uh, um, become controversial or not, and it is shown, um, and it is shown that uh, it shows that those areas that included the ethical concerns, the debate with the public, that were very open from the beginning, etc., not always, but often faced less. Um, polarization than those that came to these topics only later. Yeah, the, 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 the story of journalism and how this uh, relation has evolved in time is definitely a fascinating thing and it's partially an open issue. So there in Valencia, you have, for example, Carolina Moreno is an expert in the field. She has written about the story of science journalism, but it's definitely something that, uh, I mean, one day, if I become old and I have time, I would like to study in depth. Okay, a question by Maria Magdalena Barescu. Don't you think press releases are just PR tools for different entities that should be questioned very carefully when documenting an article? Yes, my answer is definitely yes. That is, um, this does not mean that press releases are wrong, that we sh that institutions should not do them, and that they are always trying to, um, let's say, cheat the journalist, okay? There are many excellent press officers that write great press releases and that uh, do their job in a wonderful way, and it, we would be terribly wrong if this was uh, not uh, in place. 
So for example, this project uh, by the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology of creating unities of science communicate units of science communication in many, many universities to promote science communication, I think it was an important step, okay? So it was not promoting journalism, but it was uh, promoting the transparency of this institution. So this, first of all, but having said this, this sort of information is always biased because simply it's produced internally. It uh, um, reflects the agenda of the institution legitimately, of course. So the problem is when journalists just copy paste them, okay? Uh, or simply believe them acritically. I have plenty of examples in which by simply double checking the information, by simply you know, calling independent experts, uh, checking whether there were previous press releases, etc. A news changed completely. Okay. Sometimes because I found that there was no news. Okay. So that, for example, uh, an institution says, "Okay, it's the first time that this thing has been done," and then you check the literature and you find that it has been done many times before. Sometimes simply you improve your story. So. Um, a recent case, uh, okay, yeah, I will not tell you this example because it's something we will work on in the fourth session, but an older one, there was this claim by an institution that they had invented a device for planting trees, which was basically a sort of paper box that they filled with water and put at the bottom of the tree, and this was very modern, it was the first time, etc. And then by just double checking, I found, I found a much more interesting story that this had been done before by another organization in, uh, in uh, somewhere else uh, and also tried in Spain. And so, you know, the story became much richer. I had, there were different models, different options, and it became much more interesting, okay? In the second part, I will basically give you examples and I hope to inspire you. So I've, I've given this sort of dire and a bit gloomy picture of the relation between science and the media, but then there are also a lot of positive things. And as I, as I sort of sketched at the end of the previous part, you know, there is a way of interacting between science and the media, this one that is really constructive, that is really driven by transparency and social engagement, watchdogging and critical scrutiny. And so now I will give you a set of examples of what I consider sort of the this way of uh, science, of doing science journalism that really promotes democratic participation in science, okay? So the source of many of these examples, not all of them, is a project I've been coordinating for the last four years. It's called Percientex, which means Excellent Science Journalism in Spanish, which is um, a project that tries to track good practices in science, health, environment, and technology journalism in practice. That is really building a database of examples, of basically of articles, that represent good practices in science journalism. How do we do it? We do it in two different ways. Today, I will focus on the first one, on the second one, the, the most recent, the one that we use now, which is basically every year we check, now there are over 80 excellence pres prescriptors. So we check for awards, grants, for uh, high quality journalism, conference on science journalism, books on science journalism, etc. And we basically download from these prescriptors uh, the examples that they mention. Okay, so for example, if Story received the Ortega Gasset Award and it is a science uh, journalism story, like for example, this year, this famous publication in El País on the role of uh, aerosol in the spreading of, uh, of uh, uh, COVID-19. If this happens, so if an important award is given to a science journalism story, we put the science journalism story in the database, okay? It is focused on publications in Spanish in Spain and Latin America. We have been monitoring it since 2016. I say here 56 items, but this is an old uh, transparency. Now we have over 200. This is the link. It, soon it will change. So I suggest you to Google and we will, uh, because this is a, it's a service that provides uh, a structure to build a database, but now starting from August or September, we will have our own database, but still you can, 
access it here now. If you can read Spanish, it's a beautiful, let's say, source of uh, excellent, excellent readings for this summer, for example, okay? Because basically you have one after another examples of really out outstanding, high quality uh, science journalism pieces, temporal order. So you will start with the most recent and you will get up to, to some 2016. Moreover, you can connect uh, to our website. Uh, every year we in Cosmocasha in Barcelona, we carry out an event in which there are short conversations between the authors of typically three or four of the articles that were selected for the database uh, that year with experts, which are usually former journalists or scholars or other journalists that are not in the database, etc. And so you have a 20 minute video in which they really discuss, let's say, uh, they open the black box, they explain how they built that very excellent and relevant story. So um, for those of you that can speak and understand Spanish, uh, I would strongly suggest to resort to this uh, uh, re resource to explore uh, examples of uh, inspiring example of high quality journalism. What I will do in the following is basically I will try to do a taxonomy of the things that we find in this database and provide examples both in the database and also outside of it to mix both examples in Spanish and in English. So for example, a big stream in this database is investigative journalism. Like for example, this work published in El Mundo in which they analyzed with data, with stories in the field, etc. what is the impact in Latin America of the um, surge in consumptions of quinoa in uh, Europe and the US. Uh, other examples of investigative journalism are, for example, the first story or one of the first story that uncovered famous case in Spain, uh, Nadia Nerea's case, a case of a girl with a rare disease whose parents exploited to get money. Originally, it was discovered by a science journalist, Angela Bernardo, one of the best ones that are there in Spain. Investigations, for example, in uh, the public health system, or for example, this platform, Salud con Lupa, which analyzed from the investigative journalism point of view, um, health in Latin America. Then you have things like, you know, dear old fact checking, okay? This is a famous, uh, maybe you remember a few years ago, there was a famous publication by involving Spanish scientists in which basically they claimed that, uh, I mean, the way in which the things was, was communicated to the media by the press releases, in fact, of the institutions involved was that basically cancer was a matter of chance. And Jesus Mendez, another excellent Spanish science journalist, uh, sort of dissected this claim piece by piece and uh, shown what uh, let's say survived of the claim when one looked at things in uh, in particular. Another even strain, and here is my first example in English, is narrative journalism. Okay, so um, this is a journalism with a strong literary component in which scientific topics are arrayed towards uh, are arrayed uh, in a literary way, in a narrative way. So one of the best examples in the last few years is this famous book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Sklut that uh, um, tells the story of the HeLa cell. Many of you are, are biologists, I've seen, so you are familiar with this cell line, which is the oldest one, in fact. And the name HeLa comes from Henrietta Lacks, which was this peasant from Virginia. She had a very aggressive cancer. And um, shortly before dying, a sample of uh, his cells were, were extracted, and these cells obviously are very strong, they survive uh, a lot to experiments, etc., and they are the basis of the HeLa cell line, and of many other things. So what Rebecca Sloot uncovers is that, for example, they were used for the polio vaccine, for the experiments in the atomic bomb, they were brought to the moon, they were crucial for developing in vitro fertilization, and they were the basis, in fact, of mod the modern biotechnological industry. All these without the consent of Henrietta Lacks and without his her family receiving a single dollar for that. In fact, her family, they are Afro-Americans and they, they you know, in, in these groups, there is an historical um, skepticism towards science. So, so for example, they have a, historically a very lower level of participation in, uh, in uh, scientific essays for many reasons. One of them is that up to the 70s, they were used in a very unethical way in essays. There was the, a very famous syphilis essay in which uh, Afro-Americans were led developing syphilis without receiving the proper medical help that would have been, uh, would have been ethical. And so the family, 
experienced all this story in a very tragic way. I mean, they, they were religious and they were not very well educated. So they thought that her grandmother could be suffering for all these experiments uh, in the afterlife, etc. And yeah, and just to tell you how relevant is this topic, it's not just a historical thing. Imagine that in 2013, so after the book was published, EMBL published the whole sequence of the HeLa cells genome, once again, without asking, asking permission to the family. So that sequence may contain really uh, crucial information about the health of the family, etc. And still, even after the publication of the book, scientific establishment was not mature enough to realize that uh, there were people involved, okay? So that is a very clear example of narrative journalism. Another one is one that we will discuss tomorrow. I will pick one example. It's a series I've carried out for a periodico called African Woman Scientist on the Move. So a series of profiles of African woman scientists that have left Africa and then gone back, uh, decided to go back. So not to contribute to brain drain, but to go back and uh, use their knowledge for the development of the continent. So these are really profiles. They are a bit literary. They are really try to tell a story. And then there are new ways of telling stories, okay? New forms of narrative, okay? What is called the so-called new digital storytelling. An example of this is Coding Like a Girl, a very interesting project about how a woman computer scientists work in three different places in uh, Europe, Africa, and Latin America that is told as if it were, you know, an arcade these uh, games of the 80s in which uh, the main character had to overcome a series of obstacles. So the way in which the story is told is a metaphor of how these uh, women computer scientists have to work in their everyday lives. And then you have uh, uh, videos and written stories, etc. Or another outstanding example of new digital storytelling is this publication in El País, in which they basically published throughout 28 days, 28 stories on, on the... Mensa. So every day you had a different approach on menstruation from anthropology to science to health to uh, literature, technology, etc. This is an example of me, uh, of new digital storytelling. Here it was a paper publication, a magazine, and, uh, and the, the topic was uh, soundscapes. So what you can understand from sound, what scientific conclusion you can understand from recording nature sound. And what you could do is by using the QR, you could actually hear the sound of that uh, or the soundscape of that environment. Then another very important stream is data journalism. So this work, for example, is an analysis of five staple crop and uh, how they are planted in poor countries to be consumed in rich countries. You can see it's a very uh, advanced analysis. You can enter in each one of the staple crop and uh, learn about each one of them. This was published by El Diario and El Faro. Or for example, the most important data journalism project in uh, Spain and beyond, because you can see it has been published in many different countries, Medicamentalia, which is a massive analysis on the price of drugs with very complex visualizations, etc. A couple of more examples of data journalism. The example, my examples are not contained in the database most of the Times I, I put them because they are because I know them and uh, I can explain them properly. So not all these things are come from the database. Obviously, the things in English and my examples and other examples come from somewhere else. I put them here for uh, completeness. And in this second part, I'm really trying to give you a portrait of where journalism is moving, where the most innovative, creative, democratically responsible journalism is moving. So once again, in data journalism, this, for example, is a publication in. Uh, a time in which uh, the consequences of the previous financial crisis on science were very strong, but still governments were repeating and claiming that there was no brain drain from Spain, that there was a circulation of, of brains, that uh, there were people entering and people going away, so there was not a problem of losing talent, etc. And so this is an open question because really there are no, it is not easy to track the fluxes of scientists. What we managed to get is the ResearchGate database. So we contacted ResearchGate and they gave us aggregated data on what? On the following. If you are a scientist, you know what ResearchGate is. It's basically a 
website in which you can sort of upload your CV somehow. And so a CV is a sequence of affiliations in which the last, usually the last field of the affiliation is the country you are in, okay? So by going through the CV, you can check the movements of scientists from one country to another. And the data we checked is whether within ResearchGate there were more changes, outbound changes from Spain than inbound changes. And here you clearly see in the height of the on the of the financial crisis the outbound changes became a majority so of course we don't claim this is statistically significant because research gate is not a random sample we don't claim that this is the definitive answer to the question but still it is a very strong signal that at least among those that post their cv in research gate there were this outbound movement one more example of diet of uh, of data journalism uh, an old one but a very fancy one by peter aldous which is probably the reference data journalists in uh, science journalism, he discovered that, I mean, he discovered, he focused his attention on the fact that PNAS has a sort of fast track or had a sort of fast track publication uh, tool for those that were members of the National Academy of Science. Okay, so those that are members of the National Academy of Science at that time could publish in PNAS with a sort of uh, lighter peer review process. And he obtained the data and he found the power users of this mechanism and realized that there were some scientists among them Nobel laureates that were basically publishing a large majority of the work, their work through this fast track. Okay, and so this is an interesting and significant finding that uh, questioned a lot the whole uh, the whole PNAS strategy. Going on in this, uh, let's say, portrait of uh, of um, uh, high quality science journalism and uh, generous, let's say, of uh, high quality science journalism, and going towards more and more complex uh, ways of. Uh, of dealing with journalism. This is another example related to um, brain drain, even older. What we did with a group of colleagues at El Periodico was sending out a questionnaire through basically associations of Spanish scientists abroad and asking them whether they could, um, they had gone away from Spain or could not come back due to the crisis. And we obtained, you know, like over 700 answers in matter of a few weeks, I think in the first four weeks, we obtained 400 answers. And what we found is a, a lot of uh, a lot of important stories, okay? In this case, it's uh, what we call citizen journalism because the um, in, in normal conditions, what we would have done is, you know, calling a couple of scientists and hearing their stories, etc. Here, we really relied or resorted to the internet to obtain a massive amount of stories, okay? So it, it is like that the citizens, in this case, the scientists are really an active part of the process of journalism. Another example of citizen journalism are leaks, for example, Filtrala, which is a leak platform, uh, and Dark, which is a U US based uh, science outlet. They have also a way of uh, promoting um, leaks and uh, having whistleblowers contacting them. El País has, uh, has done it himself, etc. And then one uh, other line of innovation is sensor journalism. So this is an example from the Fukushima disaster in which there basically an organization uh, provided people with detectors that were able to paint pictures, images of the level of radiation that were even more precise than the official ones. And these reverted into journalistic stories. Another very important example of center journalism that is on the rise is uh, drone journalism. Okay, so using drones, for example, to monitor uh, land from above so that you can, uh, for example, in the case of covering uh, the attacks to the Amazon forest is a very relevant tool. And one last, uh, yeah, or almost the last one, the last uh, way or track or examples I would like to yeah, give you is the issue of gamification, okay? So this is a classical example of gamification. So telling a journalistic story through an interactive game, in this case, the Climate Guardian, you can put your birth date and you get the evolution of temperatures throughout your lifetime. And then you get the evolution of temperature in your remaining work year and up to your retirement. In the case we don't do anything or in the case we uh, apply radical emission cuts and you can even share it on your social networks. So a very effective way of personalizing, let's say, the implications of climate change. 
But maybe the best example of gamification I've found is this project by Laura Rago, Carla Filialonga, and Xavier Aldeco for La Vanguardia in Spain, Missing Food. Many of these projects, by the way, are also published in English. Basically, the topic is the fact that uh, the important percentage of food in Africa, about 30%, is missed along the food chain, okay, is lost among the food chain in transport because it is attacked by microbes, etc. And so a part of the problem with food in Africa is not that there is not enough food, it is that it is lost, okay? And so they tell three stories in three different countries about it in a traditional way, but you can also access very simply, to a game, which is a chat in which two bots that represent two African uh, peasants have to decide what they do. For example, whether they buy this or this other one, where they store the seeds, etc. And at a certain point of the discussion, it's you who have to make the decision. And depending on your decision, you can lose food, lose money, lose health. And you really go through the process and realize how complicated it is to you know, match all these different issues. Okay. You don't have the feeling that you are playing with a sensitive topic because it's done in a very respectful way, but you really, it is a really different way of experiencing the same topic that is described in the stories. Okay, and then there is collaborative economy, but I will not enter in the detail. One last uh, strain is, uh, I mean, up to now we have discussed things like, you know, uh, specific scientific topic, etc. but there is one issue that is also part of science journalism that is science policy okay so the context of science so for example while it is quite normal in all others of areas of journalism to discuss you know how the movie industry is funded the economics of football etc in science this is less developed it has become strongly developed at least in spain uh, due to the multiple crises that were carried out that happened in the last few years and so science policy Covering science policy is definitely another important strain in, you know, high quality democratic science journalism and also covering other aspects of science, ranging from, you know, ethical issues like scientific fraud, etc. Or, for example, science and human rights. These are two stories I followed of two Iranian scholars, one of them, by the way, based in Spain, uh, that were jailed in uh, sort of very strange uh, conditions. OK, so that's it. Basically, now we have half an hour for. Um, for uh, discussing any question, doubt, issue you may have. Yeah, Daniel is saying about the, import the press release and important on citations. Yes, absolutely. I mean, mm, that publication was on uh, press articles by the New York Times. So one could argue that, you know, the New York Times is very important and it, it is widely written by highly educated people in the US. And so it is sort of normal that some scientists get to know um, a paper out of reading it from a newspaper, but there are other more broader and systematic studies that say that really um, having a press release attached to your paper increases citations, which by the way, I would not like, since many of you are scientists, that you take the message that then you have to write press releases on any paper you publish so that you can get more citations, because um, only press releases that work will be covered, okay? And only certain, uh, tomorrow we will discuss in detail about this, only certain scientific topics are, new, are newsworthy. There may be scientific topics that are relevant for your community, for other scientists, etc., and maybe for specialized outlets that are not relevant for the general public, even nature papers, okay? So even the, that famous nature paper published by, you know, scientists in your country, it may be simply irrelevant for the broader public and just relevant for the scientific community. But also, you know, elaborating on this, the sharp division between scientific literature and science communication literature is relatively recent, okay? I always give the example of, um, uh, of um, the origin of species of Darwin. He had uh, um, drafted a manuscript that was, you know, I think, 800 pages long, and then uh, in the end, the publication is really a sort of popular science publication without uh, many of the technical discussion, without footnotes, etc. And that is definitely something that has changed science. Okay. So, how do Spanish researchers receive this type of content? Do they follow it a lot? So, you, Lorena, what sort of content are you referring to? Do you mean mean scientific article in the press? 
while you i'm not sure what type of content you mean maybe if you can clarify in a follow-up email as daniel says we can't rely exclusively on press releases lorena i guess you are typing oh, sorry spanish readers you mean oh sorry i, I misread yeah Ah, okay, 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 fine, fine, fine. Yeah, sorry, I had misread, I thought Spanish researchers. Okay, um, I mean, broad question. Uh, in Spain, there is a broader issue, like in, I mean, there are countries like, for example, Germany, that have a strong readership, okay? So the level, for example, of subscription to newspapers has always been very high. If you move to a, you know, to a country or to a town, the first thing you do is you subscribe to the local newspaper, et cetera. And so there is, so, for example, I write occasionally for the German press and uh, you can really see that the level of uh, quality that is required and the extension of the pieces, et cetera, it's really longer because I think the readership is more mature, okay? In the case of the Spanish, of the English speaking world, um, uh, it's a very big one. There are millions of readers. And so even if it is very unequal, for example, in terms of education, still you have a critical mass of, uh, of um, high quality readerships that are open to complex content. Regarding Spanish, okay, I think it's a mixed picture. Uh, on the one hand, for some reason, uh spanish language has not managed to build a sort of pan uh, yeah a, a, a media outlet that address the whole spanish speaking region okay so el país is trying to do this there are very interesting experiences like maybe you know radio ambulante which is a podcast that uh, is not much centered, centered on Spain, Spain, but has really managed to do a very interesting coverage of, coverage of Latin America, uh, one that every person in every place of Latin America can relate to. And it is not a simple one, you know, they, they are, you know, long uh, podcasts, sometimes uh, two episodes of one hour each, etc., very complex and narrative, and they do it very well, basically. So, um, in case of Spain, there is this difficulty that there is not a sort of universal Spanish outlet like, you know, the New Yorker, the New York Times, the Guardian, etc., which sort of cover all the Spanish, uh, the, sorry, the English speaking region. And then, then in Spain in particular, the level of subscription, the level of readership, etc., is, for example, um, lower than uh, in Germany. And moreover, the overall population is smaller. Okay, so the critical mass that can economically sustain uh, high quality, complex outlet that uh, release, you know, in-depth, long products uh, is lower. So that is the context. Then going to the specific question you are asking, that is how do people receive, you know, these very complex narratives with a lot of data, long text, etc. Once I ask this to the author of um, Coding Like a Girl, and they say it, they say, okay, they receive it exactly as they received it before, you know, that long reportage that was four or three pages long in the newspaper, that is only a minority goes through it completely the day it is published, okay? Many read it later, many resort to it maybe one year later when they become interested in the topic, many just skim through it, and then you will have a minority of people that really read it and process it, etc. cetera. Uh, but still, it is very important okay um to have this sort of content because uh, the accumulation of this sort of con of content um sort of educate uh, the population into how complex things are and um and so for example when we when we we are seeing it with the pandemics okay uh a lot of the polarization and of the yeah, si simplified uh, conversations on the pandemic, et cetera, are driven by the fact that in the previous years, we had not worked enough on building a complex and uh, nuanced image of science, okay? So even though, uh, let's say, maybe you published a very complex story and then the immediate impact is not enormous, 
still the accumulation of this complex story helped to stories help to build uh, more awareness in the public. A very interesting reply to what one can do against fake news is, for example, is basically um, be become used to read non-fake news, to read complex news. This is has been proved moreover experimentally. The more you get used and trained in reading complex information, the easier you spot fake news. The easier you are able to overcome the hardwired instincts we have to buy, for example, you know, news that confirms our prejudices without checking whether they are true or not, etc. If you are used to nuanced information, you sort of automatically ask yourself questions that sort of immunize you from, from fake news. Sorry for the long answer, but it's a complex topic. There is also maybe one third, uh, one last issue that is very relevant. That is, um, we are, uh, um, the combination of the fact that uh, our life and our work is more and more precarious with technologies that deliver, you know, small snippets of information, like, you know, tweets and these sort of things has uh, driven many people away from uh, sort of uh, conscientious, uh, in-depth reading, etc. But there are some things to be taken into account. You know, first of all, there is a tendency to go back to that thing. That is, people want to read less, but read more quality. So there are experiences in Spain, like Revista Cinco W, which is, you know, this uh, international um, um, journalism uh, magazine which is all long reads and moreover you have to pay to read for them and people is paying i mean they manage to survive more or less uh, newspapers important newspapers that are implementing subscription strategies they explicitly state that they want to cover less information but more in depth and with more quality and then there is also let's say another way we have learned things from the virality and from the social networks so, for example, this famous story that I mentioned before, the one on the role of aerosols in COVID-19, uh, published by El País, um, it is a complex and nuanced story, but it is packed in such a way that it can be easily read in a in a mobile. Uh, that uh, it has some of the key information is packed into visual information that can, uh, for example, be easily shared on social networks. So. That is a way of drawing readers into a more complex, uh, 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 yeah, in a, um, into reading a longer story, okay? Instead of just, you know, browsing Twitter and uh, doom scrolling all the time. Okay, what else? How do you see the liberal situation of journalism, the reduction of specialized people in the media, and probably for these and other reasons, abuse of journalism? Alas, you have. Uh, touched upon one of the key aspects, in fact, of the of this problem. That is, um, yeah, I mean, um, I briefly mentioned it before. We, th th there is this multi-layered crisis in journalism um, that has resulted into very weak media outlets. So, for example, we have seen it in the COVID crisis, okay, especially in the early months in which there were really, really few people covering things in first person, you know, on the streets, going to hospitals, etc. Not only because people were afraid and, and not only because there was a lot of censorship, okay? So for example, people could not enter intensive care units for a lot of time, okay? And now there is a discussion on whether that was a good choice because at the beginning, maybe seeing how, um, tragic the impact was uh, being would have been useful for the public well-being okay but one other reason is that there was such a big influx of information and such um weak newsrooms that only to process the information you had to spend your day at home uh, trying to deal with it okay by the way, I think, uh, so, so that is an example of the effect uh, of journalism, okay? So, for example, we received a massive amount of uh, information on preprints, coming from preprints, uh, also a massive amount, you know, of reports, half-baked information, 
interested actors that were trying to push their agenda, starting with the pharmaceutical companies that uh, produce the vaccines. You know, they release the information in a very controlled way, even on specific days, in order to obtain uh, um, financial results uh, in uh, you know in st on stock markets, etc. And uh, it was very hard to have your own agenda in those times. I mean, I tried to do it, but only, you know, I managed to do it half of the time, okay? Because the rest of the time you had your bosses saying, you know, there is this thing happening, try to explain it in two hours, or there is this paper preprint coming out that is very shocking, write about it, et cetera. Probably I think if we had arrived to that, so this crisis with stronger newsrooms, with more specialized journalists, with more really human resources, things would have been done better. On the other hand, I think there are very luminous examples. There are very positive examples as well. That is, from time to time, and I think um, when journalists have carried out really important reporting, have discovered things that not even experts knew about, uh, this has been strongly appreciated by the public, and we could see it in the numbers. Okay, so we could really see that people were resorting to serious outlets, to you know newspapers, etc., much more than in previous occasions. Okay, so that it was also an opportunity for to understand how important, let's say, serious journalism is in these uh, times. But definitely, that is an issue. So yeah, I mean, we hope outlets like the New York Times or the Washington Post that partially the Guardian have managed to get around and build a business model uh, on the internet and now many other um, newspapers are following up so many of them are now in a subscription campaign who knows whether this model will be successful with all sort of outlets or only with top level ones we will we will see my only concern is that i mean i'm sure that journalism will survive in some way because it is needed for the for our society but i'm afraid that in the process of going to the new model there will be many deaths let's say along the path okay so one curiosity i have for you if you can type whoever wants in the in the in the chat room it is what is your main channel to get information do you refer to a newspaper do you hear radio do you watch television do you okay twitter mm -hmm. any other wants to share how they get informed mainly twitter mm -hmm. paper twitter Facebook, instagram hmm. how interesting mm -hmm. okay anybody else and let's say are you satisfied with the your experience of information gathering maybe i can share my experience as a reader i mean of course for my job i go through my newspaper and uh, maybe another one um and i also check social networks and uh, my experience is often characterized by being overwhelmed okay that is i would like to read much more than i can and uh, i feel as i spend a lot of time in prioritizing okay so in saying uh so in getting to the real important information so for example two tools that i've been uh, have been very useful for me recently now i'm really talking as a recipient of information not, not as a producer are you know um, podcast and radio so for example i regularly consume the bbc radio for international information and also science information which is uh, very convenient because I um, can do it, for example, while I eat or cook or walk or whatever. And I also use newsletters a lot. I think newsletter is really promising because it may it um, uh, sort of saves this job of prioritizing. Okay, so I don't need to go through tens and hundreds of tweets to find the relevant information. I sort of uh, have there maybe five information 
So for example, one that I love is uh, Cloche Letter, which is a newsletter and a daily podcast that is basically um, compiling information coming from the main newspapers, okay? And so every day they give you five news in the newsletter with the links to the relevant information. Yeah, and also now they have a podcast version, a five minutes podcast every morning. Cloche Letter. This one and the podcast is called I think AM podcast, but it's in it's in Spanish by the way. But there are similar things in English, in Italian, for example, there is Good Morning Italia. In English, you have uh, um, the newsletters by the main outlet, The Guardian, New York, New York Times, etc. But for example, there are wonderful science newsletters. Uh, in Materia of El País has a very nice newsletter. Now that is uh, curated by Javier Salas, um, uh, El Diario Punto Health, eh, eh, .is has a very nice newsletter on coronavirus. Um, the New York Times has a nice newsletter on coronavirus. Uh, El, uh, El Periodico has a nice newsletter on the general information, so they list the main stories of the day. One, moreover, one carried out by the director responds to this, uh, the stress of prioritizing, which I think really a crucial things nowadays. But I mean, if anybody want to share their feeling while well, I answer to Maria Magdalena. How was the team organized in order to gather info about the COVID and at the beginning of the pandemic? Well, I mean, the practical organization is that, um, you know, in a periodical, there is there are two science reporters, one that is uh, in the staff, and me that I am a freelancer. So I'm more devoted to you know more in-depth topics, original topics, etc., explainers, etc. While uh, the uh, Valentina Raffio is more into the everyday coverage, and there is one health reporter, and then there is the society section, and. Um, Basically, a bunch of those people were brought together in a COVID team that was devoted basically only to COVID. And um, and then since it was a very, you know, a, a topic that crossed all the um, sections, of course, you had contributions from, you know, politics, economics, uh, even culture, etc. Of, of course, uh, the local section on Barcelona, et cetera. And um, for example, one of the issues that we had to face was this uh, massive stream of preprints, okay? So the way we did it uh, is that we sort of created a space in which we provided this information in a um, resumed form so that we had it, and then we only picked sort of very recurrent, important, relevant topics to do more in-depth research. And then on my side, I was asked to do these sort of reactive things. So, you know, it was the first uh, reappearance of COVID in Lleida. I was asked to cover it, etc. But I always was asked to pitch my own story, okay, to mm, sort of provide um explainers to certain complex topics like you know how are um, um quick tests uh, working okay the quality of quick tests has uh, changed dramatically throughout the the epidemic so at the beginning they were not very reliable then they became more reliable but they are still not as reliable as pcr so there are certain um, complications etc and so i was asked to cover these sort of things so that was a way of uh, organizing but i must say that it was really challenging really really challenging and that probably the thing that i think was more missing was this ability or in the time to really see things in person okay so doing everything from confinement was uh, complicated. Uh, I, I will give you a very telling example. When, when there was this first uh, new, after the first wave, it, the thing started, sort of started again in Lleida, in uh, Western Catalonia, um, in which uh, 
there was a very complex situation. You know, there were people coming from abroad that came there to pick fruit, and they lived in uh, very complicated uh, health and uh, sanitary conditions. And there were other ingredients to the story. And uh, one day I was asked, you know, write an explainer of why has the things appeared there and write it by today, okay? So after sort of uh, surviving of the shock of this request, I started to call experts. And what was very interesting is that experts told me, okay, I've seen in El País this, I've seen in El Diario this and that, okay? So it was a moment in which the journalists that really had gone there and had seen what was happening there were even more experts than experts, okay? So they could, for example, uncover all the issue of the lack of uh, people tracking the disease, of how the whole tracking system was uh, um, deficient at that time, etc. And the experts were resorting to the media to express their opinion, okay? And yeah, I think this is really, really, really telling because you know in a sort of normal times usually you go to the expert and the expert knows 100 times more than you but in this sort of uh, some somebody call it post normal times okay so in which there is a lot of uncertainty stakes many high stakes at risk quick decisions to be taken etc it's really crucial to have um, effective journalism journalism in place one last reference I can give you is uh, this very nice report by Is Global called, um, its title is something about the infodemics, in which they also tell an experience. They tell, Is Global is this uh, global health research institute in Barcelona. And they say, during the crisis, we have received hundreds of requests from the media for experts on topics in which simply there were no experts, okay? On topics in which nobody had ever studied them, etc. And an expert could just give you a, yes, well-informed opinion. And they say what would have been necessary is precisely the opposite, that is investigative journalism, finding new things, obtaining data, etc. So once again, I say not everything went bad. There were journalists that did it, me, myself, I tried to do as much as I could, but we could, have, we, could have, we, have, we could have done it more if we had a more mature media ecosystem. So I think time is over for today. Thanks a lot for, uh, for bearing with me. So we meet again tomorrow at 9.30. Tomorrow's, uh, class will be much, tomorrow's session will be much more applied. Uh, it will be basically, um, I will start by discussing an example and, uh, and um, a real example of an article I have written and uh, then go through a series of criteria and questions we'll have and, and really practical tips one uh, can take into account when writing about science. And then these will be useful to do the exercises in the third and the fourth session. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye-bye.